forward to meeting you soon. Visit cryptochicks.ca to learn more. Fire! Well, hello, we are the Crypto Chicks. Uh, if you haven't heard that, because I haven't heard like that as much, uh, so we are a non-profit organization, uh, and we our goal is to bring a blockchain technology and knowledge to people, so people can use it and use it in their lives and also use it in their career. Um, we uh, right now we focus on just uh, normal people, like on everybody. Uh, of course, we have a focus on females, as you see that. For the reason, because females right now, we believe, are not very well represented in the blockchain world. It's not true for Bahamas, by the way, because look around the room. It's insane amount of women here, and I'm so glad about it. <laughs> Yeah, and I talked yesterday to some of you, and you told me that uh, in Bahamas, women are so powerful. So we would like to enhance that, and we would like to empower men as well here. <laughs> so what we're doing, we are providing uh, education. Right now, we're focusing on uh, providing education to those who want to become a blockchain developers. And for those who want to start their companies, they are blockchain companies, they are startups. We have an online uh, courses already open up for Bahamas here. We have a website. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later toward uh, my, the end of my presentation. But right now, I would like to deliver you the content that we teach all blockchain beginners, right? Blockchain 101. It never hurts. I know that most of you right now already after two days, one and a half day, you know what blockchain is. And we had an amazing panel yesterday where people actually were standing up and telling their version of the blockchain, what the blockchain is. It was excellent answers. I'm going to provide mine. Okay, so this is my objective number one for this. Uh, and objective number two is to tell you why do we trust blockchain? Why we should trust blockchain? Because there was uh, many talks about it, and uh, Michael this morning, he talked about how blockchain enables us to trust each other. But how come do we even trust the system? Why? And that's my objective number two. I'm going to tell you why. So without further ado, what is a blockchain? One word. It is a database. As simple as that. I hope you all know what the database is. Database, well, uh, uh, database is a structured set of data that stored on a device, you know, usually on a, it's on the computer or on the server. Emails, for example, your emails, it's a database. Facebook, it's a database. The great example related to blockchain, it's a bank database, right? So we all know that banks, they have their own databases. Usually it's one database that's stored on one server located in a secure building. Of course, they have many backups and everything, so it wouldn't fail. But nevertheless, it's a one single computer where this database is stored, and this belongs to one single entity, to, to the bank, let's say. So with the blockchain, it's different. Blockchain is a decentralized database. What does that mean? It means this database, same database, stored not on one computer, but on thousands and thousands of them spread all over the world. That's what it is. So, and this is the power of it. Because this is not the one computer that's stored in a bank. We all know that uh, blockchain is very much, uh, even the first blockchain, Bitcoin, is the financial system. And we're going to be talking about it further. How many times I lost money because I stored my money in a bank? Any guesses? Three times, three times I lost all my money. I'm from Russia, okay? So maybe Russia even is even worse than Bahamas. Right? So three times banks got, it's either license that got taken away or it's, it's the uh, 
crisis, the crisis that he rushes in 1998, I was pregnant with a child and my husband lost the job and we lost all the money in the bank. So that's how I did it. And, and it happened to me three times. For people in the developed world, this, is, this scenario is kind of science fiction. But the rest of the world is actually lived through it. And I did too. And this is why for, for me personally, this system is so powerful because this is not one database that's stored in a single building. This is all stored in a people's computer, so it does not belong to anyone, but at the same time belongs to everyone. And I already gave it away, but who has this? Who owns these computers? Well, of course, you know, smart guys, as we all know that, but not as smart, kids, grandmothers, anyone, it can be anyone, it can be any one of you. All you need to do is to just download the program from the internet. And voila, you are the blockchain owner, you're the owner of the node. For example, this blockchain, right? So this is Bitcoin. I'm going to be uh, focusing a lot about Bitcoin uh, today because this was the very first system, very fascinating system. And I know there is a lots of uh, rumors around it and it's stigma and it's maybe bad and uh, everything like this. We focusing on the technology, so not on the, all the bad sides of the cryptocurrency. Again, technology is given to people People make it good or bad. They make any choices, okay? So our job is tell you what the technology is. And after that, you decide what to do with it, good or bad. Hopefully good. <laughs> so this is, you download the program from the internet. This is how it looks like on, in your file system. You have complete access to it. You can go into files, you can read them. The only thing, you cannot record anything in there. Not because you don't have access, you have access. It's just because the system is so very well protected that only certain uh, programs, certain people can uh, write to it. And this, these people are minors and we're going to be talking about them. Uh, this, the system itself never been hacked so far. And this is what's fascinating about that. And I work in the software industry for a long time. I'm a, I've been a Microsoft developer for 25 years now. And I, I, I put the systems into production. I worked for Edmonton Police many, many years. And that's actually how I know why decentralized systems are very hmm, dangerous. Because I worked in Edmonton Police. I had access to everything. Everything, right? So to all people's records, I could change them. If I worked in a bank, maybe that's the same case, right? So I could change them. And uh, not that I'm, not, uh, I'm a bad person, but you know, at the gunpoint, you can do anything. Uh, <laughs> so this uh, the blockchain system actually eliminates that human intervention. You know, there's nobody to hold at the gunpoint here. All these computers all over the world are connected with each other. Any guesses what are they connected with? Thank you, sir. Yes, they all connected by internet. Very obvious, right? Uh, uh, so and, uh, at this point, I'm going to ask you the question. How do you think we can destroy a blockchain? Because this is like hypothetically. Let's say that I'm, you know, president of one of the countries and I'm just kind of rule my people. You cannot use blockchain anymore, otherwise. <laughs> anyway, so um, can you notice the difference? Uh, I'll do it again. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> blockchain wouldn't notice a difference either, you know, I don't blame you, yeah? So what's going to happen to blockchain if some country or some countries will prohibit it? Well, well nothing. Um, and just imagine, they all connected by internet, and of course internet, and uh, they need internet providers, they need power, they need, well, they need electricity, yes, yes, and I have one scenario how we can destroy it. Uh, well, for example, this. <laughs> yeah. Um, in this case, by the way, we have much bigger problems than blockchain. 
<laughs> but if only if one computer survives, we still have it. That's the power of it. Okay, so I want you to all to understand the power. And uh, I will uh, will be going uh, more about inside blockchain right now. But this is really great. This is what blew me away many years ago when I started learning about it. And hopefully, uh, you appreciate it too. All right. So what what is inside the blockchain? Um, Michael Casey this morning, uh, he uh, talked about it really well, and I, oh, I don't need to explain it anymore. You all learned it, that this is a transaction ledger, right? So this is the um, uh, transaction, that money, currency, transferring from one account to another, right? So there's many accounts, money is going between accounts, and this is a list of the ledger. You know, if you go shopping, you write down, and say, like, I spent this many cents on eggs, and uh, I got the salary this many, and this is the ledger, just of the ledger of the transactions. And I'm talking about Bitcoin because other blockchains has all the all, all different flavors, but this is uh, what Bitcoin in essence is. And this is not just the money that they transfer, not the money, maybe the, how we understand it. It's a cryptocurrency. What is a cryptocurrency? So cryptocurrencies is a digital money that is stored on a blockchain and protected by cryptography. That's how they named cryptocurrency, because they're protected by cryptography. And right now, I'm going to give you a little cryptographic lesson. Because there are people, when they say, oh, cryptography, what is that? What the hell is that cryptography? I don't understand. I can never understand. Well, you will in a second. So I took the word crypto and I applied just the simple inversion cryptographic algorithm. Don't be scared of the words. Just see the word inversion. All right. So, and on the right side, I got a cryptographic hash, the result. So I, do you see what it does? It just inverted on my letters the other way. And on the right side, I got a cryptographic hash of the word crypto. Well, in Bitcoin, it's very, very similar. It just accept it uses the uh, secure hashing algorithm 256. And what it does, it converts this word crypto into a string of seemingly random letters and numbers. And that's what it is. And that's what it used in Bitcoin to protect the data. And it takes only, you know, like less than a second, just a moment to convert it really fast, really fast operation. But the power of it, you know, if I were a hacker, of course, I want to reverse engineer and see like, oh, what does this information mean, right? Well, it's kind of uh, complicated because in order to convert it back, it takes that many seconds. And you know, like, what the hell is that number? <laughs> well, I, I don't know myself. I took it from the book, but I know that that many seconds passed since the beginning of, of our universe. You can do the comparison, right? So the hacker who wants to hack it better live you know, a long and prosperous life. All right, so coming back again. Transaction ledger that is stored inside this blockchain database. So... Uh, there are certain numbers that are mm, attached to the account that we get issued. So we got issued the account when we download this program from the internet. And this should be the wallet flavor program. And we get an account assigned to us. But actually, we got the primary key. That's what it means. That this, this, this uh, you know, again, seemingly random uh, string of letters and numbers assigned to us. This is kind of like our identification of our money in, in the blockchain, of our account in the blockchain. You need to protect, once you get it, you need to protect it with all your heart and everything. Because this key on the top right corner means that you own your money. Whoever has your private key owns your money. 
that also comes the questions about the uh, you know, different exchanges, because some of the exchanges, they don't provide you private key. It means they have it. It means they own your money. So there was a Mount Gox question here, right? If you would own your private key, would you give your money to Mount Gox? Would you need to? You wouldn't need to, right? That's why, you know, this, but people participating in this network, everybody has private keys. Exchanges, let's say, right? So they all hold accounts. Some of them, they release money to you. Some of them, they hold like a banks, right? They also, they act like a bank. That, that's what you have to be careful with. They, they are just the businesses, nothing to do with the blockchain. When they hacked, it's not blockchain that hacked. Very important to understand that difference. Hold your private key close to your heart. Hacker cannot get to it unless you give it to them. Because your private key is also protected by the cryptography. So using the cryptography, again, from the private key, we can calculate the public key and then calculate the account number. Usually you give to people your account number to transfer money to. It's not possible to calculate it back. Not with the modern technology. So that's why... When you give an account number, you're not uh, uncovering anything. Well, rather than access to, like, to the information uh, to your account, but hackers cannot transfer money. But if the hacker gets a hold of your private key, that's it. You don't own your money anymore. Somebody else does. That's because cryptographic signatures is the first level of protection in the blockchain. It means that nobody can spend a money from your account unless they have your private key. That comes from the protection number one of the blockchain that each transaction has to be signed with a private key. It means that in order to spend a money from the account, you need to have a private key. Otherwise, this transaction will be invalid. Okay, so nobody can spend money from your account unless they have your private key because a cryptographic signature of each transaction. I know maybe that's complicated, but the rule is nobody knows your private key except you. Second level of protection is actually in creating a record in this database. So I mentioned that the miners are creating the records. How do they do it? So the transactional information is not stored in one list, like it says here, right? It's stored in a blocks, in a blockchain. And miners, the ones who are building that blocks. So every few minutes, they take all the pending transactions and they record it into blockchain database because these transactions are not in a blockchain yet. So once you transfer your money, these transactions just get into some pool. They take this transaction, they build the blocks and record it into the blockchain database. But it's very fascinating how they do it. And the whole economic model around it, crypto economic model actually, around it is very fascinating because this is what makes blockchain live and function on its own and self-regulate on its own. Miner has to do a significant investment in order to make a recording to database and for this recording, the miner gets a reward, but not always. Miner makes a significant investment only for a chance because in the network there are lots of miners. Miners are also the programs that people download from the internet. You can download, you can become a miner. You can earn money, we can start doing that. It's not that easy though because of this significant investment piece. And significant, I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars Probably to earn money, you need millions of dollars to invest. How does that work? So there is lots of miners in the network. They want to all make money. They make money when they build this block. When they take this transaction, they build the block, they record it into this database. All they need to do is actually 
to create a cryptographic hash of these transactions that are in the block. This is all they doing. But, and, and you, if you remember, it takes only like less than a second to do this hash, right? Because we did the cryptographic lesson. So, you say like, oh, then, then it's easy. Well, it's not, because there is this magic number uh, called a blockchain difficulty rule. For Bitcoin, a blockchain difficulty rule right now states that hash has to start with 18 zeros. So whatever you do, resulting hash has to have 18 zeros. So the miner is actually required to add some number to this block information. So the resulting hash would be 18 zeros. If it was easy to reverse engineer, then it would be no problem. But it takes more than universe to reverse engineer. That's why miner playing a guessing game. So what they do? They say, okay, I add zero. Let's see what, what hash we get. Oh, three zeros in front. I'm doing better. One, six zeros, much better. And so on. And then, oops, no zeros. And then 123, uh, not yet. And so on and so forth, miners are guessing and guessing and guessing and when, when it's end. Okay, so right now, that's it. So at some point, miner gets this hash that has 18 zeros in front that blockchain accepts. And whoever from the miners get it first and record it to database, that's the person who gets the reward. And that's why, you know, have you ever tried to guess the combination lock? How did it go? I tried. <laughs> Anyways, but that's what Miner does. This is the closest uh, um, analogy what Miner does. They, they guess in and guess in the, this combination lock. For this, they need so much more powerful computers than the others just to loop through all these combinations. And that's why they invest in all this equipment to do it. And this is called proof of work. So miners have to prove to the system that they, they, they did so much work for this block creation. Okay, so this is called proof of work. And everybody from them, they, they all do it over and over and over again. And only one of them gets it. And only then again, one of them gets it. Okay, so, so that's, that's, what, that's how the system works. After investing millions of dollars into that, would they cheat? I guess not. Because, uh, well, who invests millions of dollars and wants to like, risk to, to lose it, right? So that's the beauty of the crypto economic model that built into the blockchain. And this is the heart of it, and this is how it leads. This is also the really great protection. But this is protection number two. I have two more to go. And by the way, uh, this, is, this is how the, when, when the new block in Bitcoin get built, new cryptocurrency got created. So right now for the block, the reward for the miner is 12.5 Bitcoin. So if you, if you multiply it to the price of the Bitcoin, it's quite a fair amount of money, right? Not, of course, not as much as they, uh, as they would um, uh, invest into this one. But, you know, it creates some profit for some of the miners, Right? So you can calculate, there, there is the systems who calculate, you know, where, which cryptocurrency, which mining is still profitable, and how much money you need to, to uh, put into it in order to be successful. But this system works. It means that it's still profitable. It means that uh, miners are still participating in it. It's still worth it. Uh, at the beginning, by the way, Bitcoin reward was 50 Bitcoin per block. Every 210,000 blocks, it get halved. So it's get halved, so it was 50, then after 200,010 blocks, it become 25, so now it's um, only 12.5. And so on and so forth, the supply amount of Bitcoin will be less and less and less and less, so no new cryptocurrency will be created, and then we only will be left with the amount that's circulating uh, I think it was year uh, 2040 or something like that, so we still have time. 
Uh, after that, Bitcoin doesn't die, of course, but uh, I will explain later why. Third level of protection. I hope I didn't lose you yet. <laughs> Blocks. They all connected to each other. So they are not on their own. And that's the third level, because in each block, there is an information from the previous block. You know this hash, this seemingly random letters and numbers? It's embedded in each subsequent block. It means that the hacker, the bad guy, if he wants to change some information, let's say in the first block, oh boy, he needs to recalculate all the hashes over and over again. And remember how much money miners spend for that? Well, a hacker must be really, really rich. Live long, really rich. <laughs> that's why this is the third level, and that's why it works. And that's why this makes it it's a block chain, right? So this is a chain of blocks. They all connect it to each other. If you change one, you have to change all subsequent ones. And in, in essence, blockchain is a transaction ledger that looks like a chain. Transaction fees. When I was studying it, and especially when I came across the term gas, oh my God, like, I'm a blonde, I can't even load my car with the gas. <laughs> and here's another gas. Uh, and then I thought, wow, well, transaction fees, like, how come? Because this system does not belong to anyone. Well, I, mean, I understand transaction fee from the banks, right? So they, is, well, they need to leave their businesses, right? But how come blockchain has a transaction fee? Aren't they supposed to be free for people? But apparently there are bad people who are spamming networks. I still cannot understand why would they do it. Like why somebody would just overload the network so they just fall down. Like the servers, for example. Even they spam servers, servers fall down. Why do they do it? I don't get it. Maybe it's a competition. I don't know. But anyways, but there are people like that. You would be surprised. And that's for protection from the people like that. So this is level four of protection. Transaction fee is a protection from the spammers. Because if the spammer wants to spam the network and create many, many, many transactions, you know, I have two accounts, I can transfer money from one account to another very easily. And creating million transactions, I will bring the network down, actually, because the network will be, still have a threshold and cannot hold some number of transactions at some point. But if I need to pay for each transaction, well, I will think twice. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably not going to do it. So this is, this is level four protection from the spammer. So when you um, build your applications on the blockchain and you have these transaction fees and you have your gas and everything like that, it's there for a reason. It is not a bad thing. This is another security thing that been put into it. And um, as I said, I've been working in software industry for a long time now, and I've put lots of applications in. The, I work for police, so we put the very critical application into production, uh, which like, protects life of the officers. So very, very important. But. I can tell you, working in the software industry and, and uh, working with the good people, <laughs> sometimes, many times, system after you know 24 hours being launched, it uh, kind of falls apart, uh, which is very fascinating case for the Bitcoin, for example, for the blockchain. Um, so, people who put it together put it into production, and it still works. Since 2007, when there were some like minor bugs here and there, which were, needed to be fixed, but nothing major. It didn't fall down, it's still working, still popular, and we're here in this room to talk about it 10 year, 11 years later, right? So this is truly fascinating for me. And, uh, last but not least, so this is not nothing to do with the protection. This is the uh, openness of the blockchain. There are, of course, different flavors of, of the blockchain, uh, but uh, we're talking about Bitcoin right now. So all this information that recorded in there, all the transactions, everything that money transferred from one account to another, 
you can see them all pretty openly anyways. There is tons of browsers developed. So I just took, uh, took it from one of them. And besides, remember, this database is stored on your computer. You can go inside and look yourself. So this is the list of, the, uh, of all the blocks and uh, actually all the transactions. And if you go inside transaction, you can see which account the money comes from and which, which, which account that it goes to. It doesn't have any names, but it has account numbers. So in terms of the traceability and openness, anyone can see it. Maybe in some cases this is not good. But we can always find the cases when it's good and when we want to see where our money went. A little bit history lesson. So I, that was the technology lesson and now history, if you're not bored yet. <laughs> okay, Bitcoin was created in 2009 uh, as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So basically just to uh, replace the banks. Uh, and it was created by Satoshi Nakamoto. And I have a picture of Satoshi here. Oops. Uh-oh. <laughs> I went somewhere far. Okay. Well, of course, this is not a picture of Satoshi. I don't know who Satoshi is, and nobody does, though some people claim that they do. Uh, but oh, I actually have, like, one of my colleagues said, he must be an alien, because imagine, <laughs> create this system that works for everybody, that still working since 2009, without any problems that people invest into, that people build on, and then people use, and then also not spending any money that he earned from it? This must be an alien. Anyway, so we don't know who Satoshi is. And we know that, uh, that lots of people, they came uh, forward and claimed that they were. They were kind of proven that they were not, and uh, we're still watching the accounts that we know Satoshi used to mine first bitcoins, and the account's still untouched. So we, there is all kind of rumors around it. Uh, so the, the truth is, we don't know who it is, and that's why I think I, I declare that that was aliens who helped us, or maybe people from the future. Right? That's. Uh, how the system was created, I told you that it was created with, uh, in mind to remove the bank from um, people's transactions, right? So because not the banks are bad, banks are great, right? So the big banks provide us great service and everything like that. But uh, in some regions of the earth, people don't have access to the banks, which is a great, great case for them when they can transfer and pay each other without involving some you know, infrastructure being there, without relying on some infrastructure being there, without relying that banks are not open after 5 p.m. Uh, so this system is great because of that. So that's what Bitcoin was all about. It's a financial system to provide people to pay each other without the bank. Ethereum. The next one I want to mention to you, this is uh, a blockchain that was, that right now is second popular, right? So maybe uh, price-wise too. It was created in uh, 2015 uh, by Vitalik Buterin, and we know that Vitalik is not an alien, that he's, he's a very special kid, but he's not an alien for sure, we know him. Uh, so he, he does exist, <laughs> right? So, and, uh, uh, so this system, is kind of like enhanced Bitcoin. So it's not a payment system, though it can be. But this system, uh, which was a smart contract and decentralized application platform, is actually providing a service to people to, um, to deal with each other without the third party. And this third party is not a bank. I'll explain. So we all deal with each other, uh, with, you know, some, for example, if I need to, there was a really, really great example from Matt yesterday. So he said, if I need to pay a lawyer and lawyer needs to deliver me something, uh, then lawyer actually can wait for a year and not pay me. But if I had somebody, you know, some kind of judge, 
um, that would say, you know what, you didn't pay him, now you owe me the penny. And that judge would be uh, not, mm, it would be the computer code. That's what it is. That's what the smart contract, contract is. It's a computer code. So we can program, for example, whatever circumstances I need so the lawyer can get the money after providing me a service, right? So lawyer would provide the service. Smart contract will just say, okay, this is check, check, check. Okay, money released. All right? So, and the smart contract can be programmed. So this is a computer program that looks like this. So all certain rules that can be programmed, and if all these certain rules are true, then money is released. So this is just, just one of the examples. Uh, for example, if even like the lawyer, right? Lawyers are perform certain functions, and in simple cases, we can all deal with each other without the lawyers. We don't need to, you know, call the lawyer for... Uh, I don't know, if, if I want you to sell my piece of something and then uh, you, you give me money or you give me something in return, right? So we, of course, it would be great to have lawyers all the time that deal between us, but sometimes we just cannot afford it or um, don't have an access to it. And so this, the pieces of code that is between us come really, really handy, and that's what the smart contracts are. And of course, as I said, uh, bank systems, so the uh, banks also can be eliminated by Ethereum, or I mean, like, as a third party, not eliminated by Ethereum, uh, this is not what I said. <laughs> yes, uh, so yes, Ethereum can be used as a payment system as well, uh, yeah, and right now it's used, I know that people are paying each other with Ethereum, I pay for some of my services with Ethereum and with Bitcoin, so there are companies that accept it, so that it can be used as a payment system. Um, but it can also can, uh, eliminate the third party that we, need to do, uh, to, that we need to deal with and make it a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Okay, th that's what the purpose of the system is. And a little bit about us. So what we do. This smart contracts code that you see, we teach that. We use our partners, so we're right now, uh, we are providing an online education. And for this online education, we use our partners, so bloggeeks.com, they opened up uh, courses for our uh, audience uh, for free. Uh, and we also have a, another partners that we use, our sponsors and the partners that provide us an educational content. Everything is online, so you don't need to be anywhere in the class. Though we are opening the chapters all over the world where we do bring people in the class if they have questions and they need the mentorships because we have also lots of mentors that work with us. We also do a hackathons, which is... Um, Maybe not already correct term anymore because hackathon, that's, it's not where you go and code. And you, not where you go and you have to know the coding, no. We have a different, different uh, systems in the hackathons. I'm going to tell you about, uh, about it a little bit later. We also try not to leave our you know, students after we educated them because we also put them into the startup and incubator programs that we right now are partnering with the, with the different programs and we also have a partners who provide us with employment opportunities for our students. People here are in the blockchain business and you know how much uh, blockchain developers worth, right? Uh, recently I talked to and they said to me, well, maybe $200, uh, 200 an hour, right? So that's, uh, that's the rate that they actually agree to pay to blockchain developer. We educate them. We want to bring more blockchain developers into this world because the technology needs it. We need more. We need to improve the system. We need to bring it uh, in the developing worlds as well so be because when people cannot afford here to pay $200 an hour for the developer, right? So you need to grow your own, and that's what we do. So right now we have a website open, bahamas.cryptochicks.ca. You can register 
uh, right away on that. So that's, that's pretty open. So we are planning a hackathon event in December this year. Hopefully we can get the venue and everything. So right now I have an um, ambassador in uh, NASA that works with, with some uh, hotels that provide us. So uh, if you have any proposals to me where we can hold the event, that would be great. I, I can listen to that. So as I said, so we have the extensive online courses from the blog geeks and also webinars from our partners. When you go to the website, I will have all the program listed, like everything, uh, all the courses there. And we constantly put in new ones on, so stay tuned. During the hackathons, we not only provide you space and the food, we also provide a mentorship program. So we, we bring in mentors. Uh, for, the, for Bahamas, probably we'll have, we'll have challenges. So if, if there are local people who knows how to program on the blockchain, who knows how blockchain businesses work, who can help us, please reach out to me as well. It would be great for you if, to get your help. And in return, of course, we will give you access to all our students that we have. So the, uh, we also do the presentation coaching. You know uh, how people... Uh, Today, the pitches, they were presented excellently, right? But the new people who come in into our system, they don't know how to do it. And some of their projects got missed by judges just because the presentation was not good. So we're teaching them how to present as well. So we also building the teams. People come to us. Sometimes it's just, you know, a girl alone and she doesn't know what to do. So we put her in the team with, you know, other girls, guys and everything. Um, we also have uh, workshops from our partners that online and on site. And uh, yeah, so for the last hackathon, we used uh, public voting. So usually on the hackathons, when you go, it's very, sometimes very subjective and uh, judges have their own opinions. So we actually had audience chance to vote using the blockchain. It was really cool because we displayed the results right away. So they voted on their phones, we displayed the results right away because blockchain, everything is open, right? So results got in a second and you saw who, who voted for who and that was so great. Uh, also, pr prize money, we usually, uh, we, we don't charge for the program, right? So we usually leave on the sponsorships. So if, uh, if, you are this, if you would like to sponsor our program, because this is a great program, if you'd like to sponsor, provide the prize money, this is a great publicity for you, it's for the good, please contact us. And of course it's fun and it creates future opportunities for everybody. So in the hackathons, we also, we have, as I promised you to tell, so that we don't only have a developers there to develop their applications, though we have a fair amount of those. Uh, we also have people who want to build the businesses on a blockchain, but don't know where to start, how to get there. So we train them as well. And during this hackathon, they actually practice with their business. They build the, the whole business model on how they will be financing it, if they will be doing an ICO or not, how, like all this ins and outs. So they are practicing their business right at the hackathon. And the good thing that they have mentorships at the hackathons, mentors who can tell them whether they write or wrong. And this is a great uh, learning opportunity for everybody. And we also start having a legal tracks in New York in October we have a hackathon we opened the legal track first time because there's lots of regulations that come right now and people don't know them so what we do we bring actually lawyers students can can they can read legal documents not all of us can read legal documents I can't I get bored after first page uh, but they actually can and they can read them, they can interpret them, they can put their businesses around them, they can teach people on actually why they did this business this way. So the business would be fully compliant with a regulation. My clicker behaving. All right. So, and also, the good thing about the hackathon um, that we did in Toronto uh, this year, so we did not restrict our uh, participants to be in, this, in the place that we, we did hold the hackathon. Though there's certain, of course, advantage when you're there, when you're with each other. It was so great to, to have this spirit and be all together. But the hackers could, who could not travel, they actually uh, hacked from their homes. 
So we, and we put them on the screen so we could see them, they hacked, and they also were judged. They were presenting right by on the Zoom. Judges could see their project. One of the projects actually was judged and, and uh, taken by Microsoft. It was from Zimbabwe. So, uh, so the, the girl from Zimbabwe, she developed a farmer market system. And Microsoft, that's how Hackathon got interested and, and took her projects in. So that's, uh, that's the beauty of the decentralized hackathons. This is just the success points of our hackathon in Toronto. We hope to repeat this success here in Bahamas as well. So we really to actually work really hard to bring this education to Bahamas. I need Bahamians help with that, that's for sure, because we are non-profit and we all in this together, but I believe together we can do the good for the, uh, for the Bahamas. And uh, before I go to review, I need to see if Christy is here. Oh, man. Because I, I would like to bring Christy on stage. Uh, she has lots to tell about the Bahamas, the specifically about Bahamas. <laughs> I have 10 minutes. Cool. I, oh, I don't think I need to click or anything. Um, so we have just about nine minutes, and what I wanted to do is put all of the kids on spot. So I think we have about 10 to 15 of them, so show of hands, please. You're not a kid. Put your hand down. <laughs> One, two, three, that, well, you are. So I was told that you guys were prepped with questions, so I want to take them. Um, but real quick before we do that, we've chatted a lot about blockchain, we've spoken a lot about cryptocurrency, but there's so many other things that we could do in this space that don't have anything to do with using the blockchain as a financial conduit. And when you think about it in the context of education, for example, are there any 12th graders? Are there any rising 12th graders? What? You guys are so young. Okay, we have one. All right. So think about a situation where you're going to need a transcript or you're going to need to prove that you graduate from high school at some point, right? You're all going to graduate. You promised me that at some point in the distant future. You promised. Good. So there's actually a, a, an application on the blockchain where you could go ahead and we could give you a credential. We can issue you a credential. So your certificate no longer has to live underneath your parents' mattress like mine does, but it can actually live on the blockchain, right? And so when you think about the questions that you're about to ask me or ask Elena or probably anybody else in this room, I want you to think about the applicability of what's really happening in your life. I want you to think about the tools and resources that you're using day to day, and I want you to start asking yourself really critical questions. Why is this working this way? How can I do this? Can I be a coder? What do I need to do? Elena gave you a litany of information, a slew of it right there. I'm pretty sure 80% of it went in your head, picked up speed, and came out through the next air. That's okay. What I want you to do right now during the next nine, well, five to 10 minutes that you have is ask all of the questions so that when you leave this room, you feel empowered to go out there and take control of your future. So let's go. First question. Okay, good afternoon. School and grade and name. Well, I attended BMES, but I currently graduated like this year, a couple of okay. weeks ago. But so my question is, say, <laughs> my question is, is what if I wanted to start my own uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, like one of those persons? What does that is an mean? Elena question. <laughs> I am in the business of making real money. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christy. Uh, can you please repeat the question? Because I thought I was called the How, If he wanted order. to go ahead and start his own <laughs> cryptocurrency, what does he need to do? Yeah. If, you, uh, if, if you want to start your own cryptocurrency, yeah. what do you need to do? So first of all, you need to ask your question, why? So why do you need to do it? Like, why do you want your own cryptocurrency? Did you see all this, you know, alien stuff that I showed you? Yeah. Are you up to it? You know, yeah. if you are, then yes, of course, you need to be very much educated in, in the security and in cryptography if you would like to use cryptography in your system, right? Which I think a cryptocurrency should be cryptography, right? So that's this is certain knowledge needs to be acquired. And um, people who build it, I can tell you, since some of them I know personally, they're kind of geniuses. If you're genius, go for it. 
If not, then maybe use the other <laughs> system because they are already built. They built for the reason they are verified, right? So we don't need another Mount Goxes that people, you know, use, lose money, and then stop trust in the system. So it's very, very. It's not only about the power, but it's also responsibility to do it. So ask yourself the question whether you really need it. Mm. Question number two. Don't be shy now. I saw you outside. Good day. My name is Kaiser. I'm, I'm a recent graduate of BMS. Uh, I have a question. I'm addressing bitcoins. Um, why should I use a bitcoin um, if I already have, have a bank account and credit card? What would be the purpose of using a bitcoin? How would it benefit me? Uh, what is the purpose of using a bitcoin? Yeah. How would it benefit me if I already have a bank account and credit card? What, how is it different from the? Is it how is it better from the credit card? Why do you need to use it? Is that the question? Is that he's I, I really think. asking? What's the alternative, right? So, for example, I have a Visa card. I have an American Express that I'm who I'm very loyal to at the moment. Why should I buy Bitcoin? Why should I use my Bitcoin to purchase my next pair of sneakers? Like. What's the benefit or the draw for doing that uh, versus if, just continuing to use American Express? Yeah, Visa. if you if you can still continue to use American Express, by all means, use it. You don't you don't need Bitcoin to do it. This and you, you don't need Bitcoin to pay with a transaction or anything like that. This is the, this system is great for the worlds where this is not available, where the credit cards are not available, or where the trust in the credit cards and a, a financial institution is lost. You know, or also we use it's not a Bitcoin that we uh, expect. For example, this is the whole technology, the blockchain. So you, for certain, can use a blockchain for good, but not necessarily to use a Bitcoin for good, right? So, well, you can still, but uh, if you have other systems, by all means, use it. Let me let me answer that. Let me give you another example. Uh, name a pair of sneakers that you like. You don't like? Okay, name something that you like. Name me a favorite phone. You prefer Samsung or iPhone? iPhone? Okay. So let's say you want to buy iPhone X. Let's say it costs $1,000, right? I have the iPhone X. You wanted to buy it. Right now you have a visa in your, your, your pocket. When you make that transaction to purchase the iPhone X from me, you first make a transaction to the bank to verify that you actually have $1,000 in order to purchase that. The only verifier in that instance is the bank. When you make that transaction with Visa, they may charge you twenty. They may charge you two and a half percent to make that transaction on the one thousand dollars. When you use an American Express, they're going to charge you four percent sometimes in order to make that transaction for that one thousand dollars, right? But the only person that's verifying is the bank. What Elena and everyone else has been telling you for the last two days is that you have full transparency when you do it on the blockchain, and instead of paying two and a half percent or 4% in transaction fees, you're now down to 0.001% or 0.005%, right? So now me having the iPhone X, I get more money in my pocket. You still get what you want, but at the end of the day, we have more transparency or better transparency into the entire process. So if I wanted to send money from my Royal Bank of Canada account or I wanted to send money in my Scotiabank account, what happens in that situation, again, they pair to pair, nobody understands what's going on, but now that you have a thousand nodes out there that can go ahead and verify that transaction, you have greater transparency. Trust me, it may not make sense to you now, but when you're sitting on a bank account with a million dollars, you want to know that your one million dollars is there and it's secured. Go home, research about the FDIC, that'll tell you a little bit more about it. Yet another question. I have another question. Um, how can you go about obtaining and selling a Bitcoin if I had one? How can you obtain one and how can you sell one? Uh, sorry, can you repeat again? I how do you hear. go about obtaining to, how do you purchase a Bitcoin? How do you purchase how a do you fraction purchase of a Bitcoin? Bitcoin? Uh, there are different ways, of course. Of course, you know, you, you can find a person who, who can sell you Bitcoin. That's the one. Uh, there are ATMs in the different countries, in the different cities of the world that you purchase, like from like a, like a bank machines. Uh, you can also purchase it from the um, exchange. So you, for this, you need to register on a cryptocurrency exchange and purchase it. So that's how you do. Also, some countries they sell a gift cards. Uh, so I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not sure how what the ways that are available for Bahamas to purchase it. So it's just the different uh, things in the different countries. Uh, usually, what I. Uh, um, 
I, I buy it on a, on an exchange, on a cryptocurrency exchange, and that's where it comes probably question about the banks. You know why I cannot sometimes use the banks? If I want to buy my Bitcoin or Ethereum, I want to transfer money to this exchange. Some of the banks they prohibit it. They said, "Huh? Oh, you, you, I cannot. Tra we cannot transfer money there, right?" So and like. How, how can I, I cannot use a visa or you cannot use the bank or anything like that. So like they uh, actually prohibiting me to do something that I want, right? So that's, uh, that's probably also answers your questions. Why would you use something like alternative payments, not, not the regular visa or the bank payments? Next question? Well, okay. You again? Yes, I'm sure again. someone else has a question. <laughs> I mean, I like you, hand. but... <laughs> All right, let's go. So... So American money is backed by American government and the uh, Bahamian dollar is backed by you know the Bahamian government. So Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum are not backed by anything. So what is the security that we have where people guess decide that we don't want no Bitcoin, that has no value to us. And I guess it's all this Bitcoin now it's useless now. So what's the security measures for that you would you believe you have? Huh? Christy, you need to translate this to so. me again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So a dollar, uh -huh. one U.S. dollar uh -huh. is equivalent to 100 pennies. That has a value to him because he's physically, he, he knows that he has a dollar in his pocket. He could take that to the bank. When he goes on the exchange and he uses that same dollar to buy a fraction of a Bitcoin, how does he know whether or not that, bit, that value that he's purchased at that moment in time is going to go up in value or is it going to depreciate in value? Yeah, the, the, que the answer is you don't. That's the thing. <laughs> you have yeah. no security. Yeah. So it's, right. it's, it's nothing to do with, this, yeah, with, the, with the technology security or, or anything like that. It's, it has to do with the popularity of the Bitcoin, uh, of the popularity of these cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, right? So uh, when you invest in, and that's why I never give the investment advice, <laughs> because it's all the games, right? So this is, yeah, stock markets is the same. You know, nobody knows, right? So if, if you would know, everybody would be millionaires, but we're not. Uh, yes, so you, you don't know. You just uh, take a blind guess whether you do it or not. You just risk your money. Wh whatever you can, uh, if, if you have only one dollar, don't risk it. Don't lose it. <laughs> Markets are volatile. If you have one dollar to spare, then maybe it's worth it. Yes, yeah, so, so yes. Markets uh, are volatile is, at the yes. end of the day, right? So if you even think about the stock market, when things are really, really low, a lot of people go ahead and they invest in gold because that's a lot secure. When things are really, really good and people have a lot of liquidity, you see a lot of action on, on the stock market. Think about cryptocurrency being in the same thing. You're always going to have different levers that cause the stock market, your value of your uh, cryptocurrency to either go up or go down, and that's a risk that you have to be willing to take. So again, when, again I'm not a financial analyst, but whenever you go in it, go in it for the long game. So don't think about, oh, am I going to make money within a day? Am I going to make money within five days? Think a little bit longer than that. I know you're young, so you know a year probably thinks a really long time for you. But at the end of the day, like, think of the end game. Next question. Hi. How y'all doing? My name is Abigail from Sunland. I'm in the 12th grade. And I just wanted to know, what's an easy way to learn coding and how to become a hacker? Like, <laughs> <laughs> crowd, all right. I plead the fifth. <laughs> Easy ways to Google it. Uh, no, uh, so if you, if you seriously for this, uh, you should not settle for the easy way. Yeah, so this, uh, you know, if you really want to do it, invest your time into it, and then it will pay off, right? So there is no, it's not easy money, it's not easy profession, that's for sure. If you're in, it, in for it, you're in for it, and will, it will be rewarded. But just be up to it. I have a question for you. How did you learn how to read? How do you think you learned how to read? What is it? Phonics. So you read books at some point. Pick up a book. How do you think you recognize that a building is a building? Like an apartment you could argue is a building, right? A hotel you can argue is a group of buildings. Coding is the exact same way. You start to identify patterns. And once you learn that, then you can start to break things down a little bit more simpler. Literally, OK, Google. 
I want to learn how to code. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yes. Start there. One more question. Do you have time for one more question? Uh, or yeah, and we provide but, the courses. If you, if you already, if you want to learn about blockchain, here go to our website, see what the courses are in there. You can sign up for free. Do it. Try it. All right. The young man in the code too. Let's go. Um, good afternoon. My name is Charles Denbo. Um, my question, um, well, first, I think I recognize you from a tech summit which was held there. I recognize in you from the tech summit. <laughs> so, you are a representative from Google, right? I was. I actually, you was? oh, I should probably introduce myself. So, uh, I quit my job at Google four months ago. Right. Um, I spent time working at Google, I've spent time working at Goldman Sachs. I've recently launched my own software development business in the Bahamas. Um, <laughs> And in my philanthropic life, I serve on the Board of Trustees for the University of the Bahamas. I'm chairman of the Board of Directors for a STEM uh, nonprofit in New York City, and I was also appointed by the mayor to serve on the uh, Jersey City Free Public Library Board. Okay. So, my question is, at, during your time at Google, since you're not there I mean, anymore, you know. Um, was Bitcoin, like, or any cryptocurrency supported through like the services which Google offered? So at the time that I was there, I don't think so. I do know now that Amazon, I think, has started to accept some form of cryptocurrency, right? I wouldn't be surprised if within like Google Play and Apple Pay, they start to accept it. But again, with a lot of these things with very nascent technologies, companies that are that large, take, they're like, you know the difference between like a cruise ship and a speedboat? Like right. a cruise ship is really, really, really slow to turn. And the right. reason that these companies are really slow to pivot is because they're large and they have, to, they have to consider the risk that they're undertaking before they do that. Amazon, Jeff Bezos, very different character, very different guy, not surprised that he did it. But with smaller companies who are interested now in taking on, like taking crypto as a form of current, uh, payment, it's because they're speedboats. They're faster, they're nimble, they're more agile, they can, they can turn a lot fast. And they could actually recover from losses a lot greater than a large company like Google can. Right. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, no more questions. We have to stay on time. But what I can say is that Christy and Elena are going to be available. And so you can do with networking. And uh, so we turn it over to our... Um, um... Oh, that's it? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elena and Christy. No disappointments here, right? <laughs> Wasn't that fantastic? Do you guys feel like you've learned a lot just by that session? I sure did. No doubt we will continue to do the same throughout the conference. We now encourage you to network and share what you've learned, and we encourage you to take a brief break. We ask that you return to your seats um, in about 10 minutes. It's now about 3.25, so at... 3.40. We ask that you be back inside and hear from our panel of Bahamian blockchain enthusiasts, moderated by Mr. Michael Casey. Thank you. At its inception, Alive promised to provide all major islands of the Bahamas with superior products and services, and we continue to do that daily. With more than approximately 103,000 subscribers, Alive has changed the telecommunications industry. We consistently stress that Alive is more than just a phone company, but rather a diverse, ever-evolving entity dedicated to fostering meaningful experiences and pioneering groundbreaking technology. At Alive, we believe in promoting the advancement of technology in as many ways possible. Technology impacts every domain of our society, education, sport, community engagement, arts and culture, healthcare, and of course, financial services. Back in November of last year, Alive launched its Smart Innovation Strategy right here in Grand Bahama. Since that time, we have worked diligently to provide innovations in healthcare, civic engagement, and education as part of that agenda. 
We have also introduced innovations in our business services by launching one, the most comprehensive and technologically advanced loyalty rewards program in the market, The List, an app-based rewards tool available to both our corporate partners and our subscribers that provides a unique and efficient way to bring both companies together with prospective consumers. Two, an innovative cloud-based push-to-talk tool that can be used across a lives network anywhere in or out of the country once LTE service is available. We also continue to perfect our ever-evolving and flexible product suite that is designed to give the consumer maximum options at the best value. Products. Finally, we look forward to completing at the end of this month and upon the second anniversary of our license award, the complete rollout of our network throughout the entire Bahamas. We have achieved much, but we are not resting on our laurels. Last year, we joined the Bahamas Financial Services Board as the exclusive telecommunications partner of their FinTech Working Group. Through our participation in this body, we hope to continue to work with the foremost minds in financial services and law to help the country to prepare for the blockchain and cryptocurrency revolution. This is a unique partnership that is entirely in keeping with the way we do business, to be at the forefront of all new innovations in the marketplace and to bring these innovations to the Bahamian consumer. We are happy to be back in Freeport to deepen our participation in this arena and to be a part of the first Bahamas blockchain and cryptocurrency conference. We look forward to an exciting few days with you all. Thank you. I believed in all the rest. Now my eyes are open. I finally see. And I believe in best. At its inception, Alive promised to provide all...